Early humans had very little understanding of the processes and causal relationships behind natural phenomena. Why the sun rose and set, why winds blew, rain fell and droughts afflicted them. They believed gods must be making these things happen. They sought the favour and aid of these gods to help them survive and prosper. They offered sacrifices to bring the rain, chanted incantations for the sun to return, and made supplications for fertility and a good harvest. It appeared to them that God was directly intervening and controlling the elements, either sending them or withholding them, according to whether he was pleased or angry. Success was ensured by pleasing God, so he would make the rain fall, crops grow, offspring plentiful, and enemies destroyed. While if he displeased God, he would bring down calamities, droughts, floods, and destroy whole towns. This is how humans, for a large part of our existence, believed the world worked. The Qur'an reflects this view of God. Success is gained by pleasing him, obeying him, bowing, and prostrating to him. He sends the wind and rain to whoever and wherever he wants. He brings the sun up from the east, causes night and day, life and death, sends floods, earthquakes, sandstorms, hurricanes, and blasts from the heavens down upon disbelievers. He holds birds up in the sky and carries ships on the sea. He apportions kingdoms and takes them away, honours who he wants and humbles who he wants. Nothing in this world rises or falls, moves or is stationary, except by his active involvement. However, one of the reasons many people in modern times have begun to doubt religion is because we have come to understand that there are natural laws that govern these things. We understand why earthquakes happen and tsunamis occur why the sun rises, rain falls, and deserts bloom. We can calculate these laws and observe how they follow predictable patterns of cause and effect. They don't require any supernatural intervention, and we can harness them ourselves without the need for offerings, prayers, sacrifices, or obeying religious laws. We observe that at no time are the laws of nature broken, we never see any divine interventions that contradict them. There is no tangible benefit conferred on those who pray, nor negative consequences to those who don't. We do not see the wicked destroyed by floods, earthquakes, hurricanes or devastating blasts from the sky. Whether you obey God or not makes absolutely no difference to the running of the universe and its natural processes. Of course I realise that, as the frontiers of our knowledge are pushed further and further back, many religious apologists have shifted the concept of God from a God who constantly interacts with humans and performs miracles towards the concept of an imminent, transcendent God who works indirectly and mysteriously within the natural laws, which operate without prejudice to believer or non-believer. That's all well and good, but it's not the image the Qur'an conveys. On the contrary, the Qur'an frequently narrates how God does indeed directly control the natural elements with extreme prejudice, sending floods, hurricanes and earthquakes upon those who disbelieve, and miraculously rescuing his faithful. Have, Have they, they not, not seen how many generations, generations we destroyed before them? them? We destroyed them for their sins. Those before them disbelieved in our signs. So Allah seized them for their sins. Populations before them disbelieved. So we destroyed them. So will you not believe? God's direct control of the elements is constantly cited as a sign, ayah, and proof of his direct power and authority over everything that happens, right down to the tiniest detail. As a result, the Meccans were constantly asking Muhammad to bring them a miraculous sign. They had heard all the stories the Qur'an relates of the miracles of the past prophets, such as Jesus creating a living bird from clay, curing the blind, healing lepers, and bringing the dead to life. And quite reasonably, they asked Muhammad for some similar miraculous signs. They say, why is not a sign sent down to him from his Lord? 
But the Quran only responds by citing natural phenomena as miraculous signs and proof. For example, do they not see the birds held poised in the air? Nothing holds them up but Allah. Indeed, those are signs for people who believe. Well, yes, nothing holds them up but Allah, albeit indirectly, by way of aerodynamics, airflow, and millions of years of evolution. I realize Muslims will say, it's still Allah who made these natural laws. But let's be honest, it is a rather disappointing sign, nevertheless. The Meccans were hoping for something similar to the miracles of past prophets. I mean, we're talking about a god who raised a mountain over Bani Israel, parted the Red Sea, and raised the dead. Saying, look at the birds, is not quite the same thing. One can perhaps see how those with no understanding of the laws of nature might be impressed. But did the author of the Qur'an not foresee when humans understood natural phenomena, this sign might seem much less impressive? Amongst the other proofs the Qur'an repeatedly presents is to travel through the earth and see for ourselves how God has intervened to bring his wrath on disbelievers. Say, travel through the earth and see what was the end of those who rejected truth. But I'm at a complete loss at what the Qur'an wants us to see. The end of those who reject the truth looks very similar to the end of those who didn't reject the truth. The ruins of disbelievers looks very much like the ruins of believers. How is one supposed to know who was destroyed by divine intervention of fire and brimstone from those subject to the regular course of events that all humans are subject to? Where is this evidence that the Qur'an seems to think is so obvious to anyone who travels through the earth? In fact, the reality of what we see around us, both today and throughout history, is that disbelievers quite often fare better than believers. Nevertheless, the Qur'an constantly threatens disbelievers that they will be destroyed, just as the disbelieving people of Noah, Hud, Saleh, Lut, Sha'ib and Pharaoh were destroyed. The Qur'an asks us menacingly, Do you feel safe that he will not cause the earth to swallow you up, or send against you a storm of stones, or send upon you a hurricane of wind and drown you for your disbelief? But are disbelievers swallowed by earthquakes, destroyed by hurricanes or drowned in floods? Or do such natural disasters afflict all humanity, regardless of their beliefs? In fact, tell me truthfully, is it not the innocent and the poor, including many Muslim nations, who frequently suffer most from these things? The Qur'an never ceases with threats. It heaps threats upon threats. Do those who have planned evil deeds feel secure that Allah will not cause the earth to swallow them, or that the punishment will not come upon them from where they do not perceive? Do the people of the cities feel secure from our punishment coming to them at night while they are asleep? Or did the people of the cities feel secure from our punishment coming to them in the morning while they were at play? But have these threats ever been carried through? Or are they just empty threats? Does God not really mean what he says? Soon you will see, and they will see. Threats are a poor and fallacious argument that I would expect a wise and merciful God to be far above. The Qur'an shamelessly exploits the fears and vulnerability of the human condition to coerce its audience to accept Islam. It appears to be totally unconcerned that faith achieved through fear completely undermines both its genuineness and the unimpeded exercise of free will. That which is done under duress can never be a genuine and sincere free choice. It also raises the question, why would you need threats to make someone believe something if it is plainly and obviously true? And if it is not plainly and obviously true, why punish them for disbelieving? Once you get past these threats, there is actually very little of substance in the Qur'an to convince the reader. The Qur'an depicts a world full of divine miracles and interventions, angels, jinn 
and wondrous tales. Then it demands we travel through the earth and see for ourselves. But all we see is a complete absence of God intervening anywhere. We see no miracles, no angels, no jinn, and no evidence of its wondrous tales. As though God has retired to the seventh heaven after writing the Qur'an and taking the angels and jinn with him. Despite that, the Qur'an says, You will never find in the way of Allah any change, and you will never find in the way of Allah any alteration. Really? Tell me, does God do things in the way he used to, or not? Has humanity's ability to scientifically test, record and verify God's miraculous interventions persuaded him to change his ways and methods? It seems that the God of the Qur'an is now content with threats on a page. And just you wait. We too are waiting. And we are still waiting. Lastly, why do something indirectly through natural laws when God only has to say, be and it is? How much more convincing would the signs related in the Qur'an be if they did actually occur without any discernible or observable natural laws, as our ancestors mistakenly thought? Why deliberately create the universe in such a way as to ingeniously conceal his direct and miraculous involvement in it, and then eternally torture those who doubt?